near the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <coughs> Our Lady, Star of the New Evangelization, Saint Joseph, our patron saints and guardian angels, near the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The readings today are very much centered on old law and new law. The first reading we hear from Sirach was telling the, the persons that he was addressing it to that if they keep the commandments and uh, do what God has commanded them, they will, they will be blessed and that they have a choice before them. They can either choose good or evil, but they must choose. Uh, that's before us we have life and death, he says, good and evil. Whichever he chooses shall be given him. But, of course, those who are truly wise will choose to follow God's way, and that God is that truly wise God and all-powerful and all-seeing, and he sees everything, and he will reward us according to our deeds. If we do evil, we will be punished. If we do good, we will be rewarded. And then he says that uh, God is not the one who ever authorizes or has ever given anybody license to sin. You know, sometimes it's popular, people will say, well, a devil made me do it. Well, even less did God ever make you to do it, because God does not authorize or give license to us to sin. God is, God is good. There is no evil in him. God permits evil. He permitted uh, Lucifer and the fallen angels to reject his will, and they were punished for it. And he gave uh, Adam and Eve... The, the choice to not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and of course they rejected that, and they were punished accordingly. But yet for the men, for Adam and Eve, uh, because Our Lady was in the loins of Adam, according to St. Bernardine of Siena, mankind was given a second chance, and God wanted his son's mother to come into the world, so God gave a penance to Adam and Eve and promised them the Redeemer. And that is this other law that God will establish in his son, that even in the Old Testament, you were blessed if you followed the law, which was the old law, which was the law of Moses. There were certain blessings attached to it. Even though it couldn't give you the means to to live it interiorly uh, to, to its fullest, yet... If you followed the Ten Commandments and the Old Law, you were much wiser than the pagans and those around you who maybe had an inkling of it because it's part of the natural law, but you were blessed because God had revealed to you what would make you happy, how you would truly be blessed in life if you followed the Ten Commandments, which Moses was uh, given by God on stone tablets, and Moses promulgated them to the Jews. Later on, the Jews, you know, because of human weakness and because of just the faulty nature of fallen mankind, they added a lot of other things that are not part of what God wanted them to observe. You know, the Pharisees added all these other prescriptions and other unnecessary things which our Lord was not happy with, that really had nothing to do with, with following God and doing his will. But it became kind of like part of the ritual of this particular club, you might say, that had formed within the Jewish religion. But the true wisdom and the true blessings that God wanted them to observe were the Ten Commandments and that which was associated with it. And, of course, to already in symbolic fashion to sacrifice, to offer uh, various sacrifices to God, which were to prepare them for the coming of the Lord when they would recognize in our Lord the true Paschal Lamb 
and the true sacrifice that was to be offered for their sins. And even in St. Paul's letter, he speaks again that the wisdom that God has given us, and it far surpasses even the wisdom of the old law because the wisdom that God has given us in the new law is not written on stone tablets, but is rather written on our hearts. And all that the old law was, you might say, preparing us for, we have received in its fullness in the New Testament, the New Covenant, the New Law established by our Lord. And that uh, those in the Old Testament, they didn't recognize this wisdom of God. And if they had, he says, they wouldn't have crucified our Lord, but rather they would have accepted him and embraced him. But even that was, to, God used that to our benefit because he even made it even more clear by his death and resurrection how far this new law surpasses the old. And uh, that uh, God has given us this spirit that now dwells in our heart by grace to help us to live in a way which is far superior to the old law. And that's what our Lord is making allusion to and in teaching in the gospel today. He is reminding them he didn't come to abolish the law, meaning the old law, meaning the Ten Commandments. He didn't abolish those. He abolished the rituals of the temple. He abolished all those things which were no longer uh, required because you had now the real sacrifice. You had the sacrifice that God had instituted. But the, the old law that he fulfilled was that of the Ten Commandments uh, in that he gave us now the grace to be able to live them. And he gives a whole teaching here about, you know, that I don't want uh, anyone to, to minimize the necessity or the importance of the old law. Of course, he's talking about as I said, the Ten Commandments. If someone teaches you to not observe them, they will be least in the kingdom of God. And if someone teaches you to observe them, they will be great in the kingdom of God. Because those are very important. And even today, they are still enshrined in the teaching of the church and in the catechism. The Ten Commandments are there because it's part of the moral code. They're part of the, the plan that God has for our happiness. And yet we see... Uh, there are people, you know, the media and many who are teaching people to not obey God's law. And that's, our Lord is saying, woe to them. For they, being least in the kingdom of God means you won't have a place in it. Because to not, uh, to, to lead others astray, even our Lord has said, you know, someone were to scandalize or to teach his little ones uh, lead them astray, you know, the millstone is waiting for them, and you won't find millstones in heaven. They will take you down to a lower place. And he is saying that this righteousness, this holiness that he's giving in this new law will far surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees because it will be real. Their righteousness, for the most part, was pretend. It was a facade it was not real holiness. It was a caricature. And in many cases, it wasn't even close to it because they did many immoral things under the guise of doing righteous things. You know, they would swear an oath to God so they wouldn't have to observe their uh, duties to their parents, which our Lord said that is. Talk about a contradiction. Um, that was how confused and, and uh, twisted, the Pharisees and men like them had twisted our Lord's uh, revelation. And then he goes on to show how the new law far surpasses the old. And he says, you have heard it said, and then he'll give you the Old Testament. You shall not kill. Whoever kills will be liable to judgment. But he says that in the new law, even if you're being angry, you'll be, you will be called to task for it because you have the grace now to even interiorly be able to observe 
these things that in thought, word, and deed, you're able to have the grace to overcome. But he does give here, interestingly, different levels of, of punishment. He says that those who are angry with their brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, will be answerable to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was one level of the court, you might say, that was when things more serious were presented to them. Minor offenses were judgment was a lower, a lower tribunal. But if you did something more serious, it went to the Sanhedrin. And he says here, if you do something, you say, you fool, you will be liable to fiery Gehenna, which... For the Jews, the Gehenna, the Valley of Gehenna was the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem and it always reminded the Jews of hell because there was always fire and smoke there because people were burning garbage. And he's saying you will be, some sins will even condemn you to such terrible punishment as that. And then he reminds us that if you want your your gift to be acceptable to God, then you have to be forgiving. You have to reconcile with your brother before you present your gift to God and to settle with your opponent because you will be handed over the judge someday. And he does give an inkling here. Uh, uh, it implies that the existence of purgatory because he says here, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. So that we see that there are some punishments that are temporal and some are eternal. And uh, for those who think that our Lord didn't teach about purgatory, he gives that, he, he implies that the existence of it in this gospel. And then he teaches about marriage, about how even in the new law of grace, uh, not just adultery, but even looking at someone in their, in their heart with sin uh, has already committed adultery. And that is uh, all these things. He's trying to teach them the importance of this new law that he's establishing. And he then says to them, he's not telling them or advising them to commit mutilation. He's saying spiritually, if you want to, if you have this grace that I'm giving you, you also have to do practice mortification. You have to cooperate by denying yourself. So that if your right hand, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's not saying literally chop it off. He's saying by mortifying it, you in one sense spiritually are cutting it off. Mortify means to put to death. When we mortify our passions or mortify our sinful inclinations, we are literally putting them to death. We're trying to cut them off. We're not trying to feed them by encouraging or indulging them. We're cutting them off by denying it. So if someone has a tendency to, to steal, and literally he has to, in his heart, has to cut that off. He has to stop stealing. He has to mortify it. If his eye causes him to sin, he doesn't go and pluck it out. Rather, he mortifies it. He spiritually plucks it out by not looking at those things anymore. And because, as he says, it's better for you to do that, to mortify that, than to go to hell, to hell with all your members. Uh, he, our Lord is using this strong language to get a point across. Of course, as I said, he's not advocating mutilation. And then he finally continues to even give a further teaching about the indissolubility of marriage. You know, there's a big thing out there today. Everybody says, oh, the Pope may change about divorced people being able to receive communion and who've been remarried outside the church. Well, uh, that's what they would like to think, but the Pope has, through the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, has once again restated the teaching of the church because it's not the teaching of men, it's not the teaching of men from the Middle Ages about the indissolubility of marriage, it is the teaching of Christ himself, and that will never change. So those who are waiting for that to happen are going to be waiting a long time. You know, that's, um, that's the, um, the rude awakening that they may, will have to accept. God is like this immovable rock. 
And you know, it's even compared. The Lord is my rock. And you can't push this rock. If you keep pushing against the rock, the only thing you're gonna do is bruise your head or hurt yourself. And our Lord is saying that that rock is there for a good reason. It is to be a solid reminder to us of what is our, for our happiness. And he has given these things to us, these teachings, not because God is trying to make us miserable or to just, you know, it's because he wants us to be happy. He wants us to see where is the true law of freedom, to truly live what Christ has established, to live the faith, to live the Catholic faith in all of its aspects, both the moral teachings and those which are considered more lofty, like the Trinity and the Eucharist and the real presence, all these are meant to, for our happiness. They're all to give us that true joy that only Christ can give, that only can come from living the gospel, as Pope Francis wants to remind us. So all those out there who think that the church is the biggest party pooper, you might say, out there that destroys all your fun, they're really going to be in for a rude awakening. Or hopefully we pray that they will receive the grace to realize that what they have been doing all this time has been kicking against the goad, as St. Paul said in his writings, you know, that they're really kicking against the thing which is to their benefit. And that they will realize that uh, they need the, this, this grace. They need what our Lord is offering them for their true happiness. This is the, the humility that we need, that the man needs to humble himself to realize that he doesn't have the answers, that God has given the answers for what are the true essence of what is to be happy in life. There are many people out there who say, well, I question the teaching of the church. Well, it's all right if you have some questions, but is, are, you, are you wanting the answers? Are you just saying, I'm questioning because I want to throw it into doubt so I can do whatever I want? If you really are questioning, that means you're looking for answers. And, uh, and the church has the answers, not because in some kind of arrogant way, but because the church has been established by Christ, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has the answers. He has given us all that we need to know to make us happy in life. Let us pray that we will always have the humility to accept it because we can't be proud of our quote unquote orthodoxy. We can't think that somehow we're you know, always going to be uh, enlightened about this if we always must always be humble and say thank you Lord for giving us this grace to to know and to believe and to follow you. But we also pray for those who do not yet or have not yet received that grace that they will open their hearts to Christ who is knocking and wants to enter. But as he's always reminded us that the doorknob is on the inside and that they have to open up and receive him. Let us pray that Our Lady will Grant them the grace, the star of the new evangelization will lead them to Christ and to his, to the happiness and joy that he wants for them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.